Body Watch is produced by WGBH Boston in association with American Health Magazine. Hi, I'm Dr. Red Duke, and I'm your host for Body Watch. This time on Body Watch, we'll show you how to start and stick with exercise. Kathy Stein lost 100 pounds after years of yo-yo dieting. It was exercise and attitude that made the difference. Now, why do most people who start exercising stop? And what does it take to motivate yourself? And how much do you really need to be healthy? You just hold on there, don't run off. We're just getting started. Come on, bud. Body Watch is made possible by the makers of NutraSweet brand sweeteners. Taking good care of ourselves makes life a little better. And NutraSweet makes it a little sweeter. How do I go, Mike? You know, in spite of everything that we hear and read about Americans exercising, the fact is, Americans don't exercise and stick to a program regularly. Recently, the U.S. Public Health Service reported that only 20% of Americans exercise regularly. Maybe 30 or 40% of us make a stab at it every now and then, and the rest of us are just a bunch of old gold-plated first-rate couch potatoes. Now, there's probably a couple of good reasons for the way we treat exercise. Either we don't believe it is important enough to motivate us sufficiently to get in a regular exercise program, or we get on a program that's too strenuous and it ain't no fun and we quit. Every dancer in this fat burner class is determined to lose weight through exercise. But one out of every two of them is gonna drop out. The inability to stick to an exercise program of any kind has become a leading public health problem. We've had a lot of rosy predictions about how many adult Americans are exercising. Some surveys have said that 60 or 70 percent of adults in our society are exercising. But when the United States Public Health Service looked at this, they found that only 20 percent of adult Americans are exercising enough to derive the most important cardiovascular benefits. Most people who start to exercise stop. And that's alarmed public health officials who believe exercise and fitness is critical in the reduction of premature disease and death. The Center for Disease Control looked at the results of 43 major exercise studies and they came to a very startling conclusion. What they found was that if you take the most active adults in our society and compare their risk of heart disease to the least active adults, the least active adults have almost twice as much chance of developing heart disease as the most active adults do. Heart disease is the number one killer in America. Regular exercise can help prevent it. Exercise can also ameliorate the debilitating effects of other diseases such as osteoporosis, diabetes, back pain, and hypertension. It's little wonder that there's a growing number of health specialists that are struggling to figure out how to get us active. Two side, two, three, and For four, patients in the more. cardiac rehabilitation two, program three, at the Massachusetts four, General four, Hospital, two, three, fear is three, one motivating four, factor. Everyone you see has either had a heart attack, angina, bypass surgery, or all three. And no one wants to go through that again. Everybody here has heart disease, and in my view, that represents a failure of American medicine. Our profession is extremely good at dealing with diseases once they've occurred, but as a profession, we haven't been so good at getting people to do the relatively simple things which could prevent them from becoming ill in the first place. One preventative measure is exercise. Under Dr. Simon's tutelage, patient Nelson LeClaire was able to start and stay with an exercise regimen for the first time in his life. Nelson was clinically dead. Fortunately, this happened in a hospital. He was revived. Uh, he had bad coronary heart disease, required bypass surgery. Uh, but fortunately was able to look within himself, understand the reasons that he'd gotten into trouble, sedentary living, high cholesterol, high blood pressure in his case, and reform. At 50 years of age, Nelson began to run and he dropped 60 pounds. He now jogs 30 miles a week. For Nelson, exercise has paid off. His blood pressure is normal, his cholesterol profile is excellent. His physical work capacity uh, exceeds, I'm sure, his wildest expectations before he became ill. 
I not only feel better, I have to say, sometimes I run in the morning, and I feel better on a day at work if I run in the morning. They talk about a runner's high. If it's true, it happens every time I go out. Now, Nelson doesn't just run. He runs the Boston Marathon, a grueling 26-mile race. In 1987, his second race, he crossed the finish line arm in arm with his fellow heart patient. When I crossed that finish line, it was a feeling that I had never felt before. I was ecstatic, and it took me four days to come back to Earth again. Now, why did Nelson stick with the program when so many of us fail? Well, he had a couple of key support mechanisms in place. He was a part of a supervised program. He had the complete backing of his wife and family, and he believed that exercise would make him healthy. But doctors are quick to point out that belief in the value of exercise is not enough. Most of us are perhaps more motivated by how we feel than uh, pursuing what we think is going to happen. So that's probably one of the reasons that beliefs in health benefits or the knowledge that exercise is good for you is uh, a motivator for getting started, but not very effective for keeping someone involved. It seems that the most important factor is that we enjoy what we're doing. Dr. Dishman is involved in a study to see how much pleasure, if any, that we get from different types of exercise. He hopes to explain why some of us exercise consistently and some of us don't. I want to ask you, I want you to tense your calf. Okay, tense. Dishman has come up with a profile of Relax. folks most and least likely to exercise. Ironically, those least likely to exercise are the ones that need it the most, namely people who smoke, who are overweight, and are sedentary. People who exercise more tend to be better educated, and people out west exercise more than folks down south. But that doesn't mean you have to relocate if you want some stick to itiveness. Dr. Dishman has some tips that can help anyone stick to a program. Make your workout site easy to get to. Swim at a pool around the corner, walk in a nearby park. Plan your day in advance so you have time to exercise and vary your routine and be a little flexible. And accept the fact that you may have a few slip-ups. If you don't have that flexibility built in and you interpret those slips as fatal signs that you're going to fail, you've blown the whole program, then you're dooming yourself to failure from the beginning. Whatever you do, choose something you like. Newfangled equipment may help. Dr. Rippey studied the effect of computerized life cycles on motivation. These stationary bikes give cyclists readouts of their energy expenditure. About 80% of the people in his program tested at YMCA's across the country like the bicycles enough to stick to them. Carol Schustack was one of them. I was looking forward to it, and I'd come in and um, try to beat the bike. And you can pace yourself. If it's a hard workout, you know that you've only got so many seconds more because the lights change, and you can anticipate it. So you can, it makes you work. For gosh sake, set realistic, attainable goals for yourself, and be patient with yourself. Otherwise, you're going to hurt yourself and probably quit. <laughs> Health and fitness are a lot more than being muscle-bound, sore, and sweaty. It's a balance of mental and physical well-being, and that's the real goal. The health hazard is inactivity, and I think that what has happened over the last 10 to 15 years is that people have gotten too hung up on the idea that in order to derive benefits, you have to exercise at a certain level. What we really need to do as the public health message is say to people, the worst thing you can do is be inactive. But the real message is just be active. And that doesn't necessarily mean going to a health spa. Many people find running around the track boring. Many people find sitting on an exercise bike boring. And the reason for it, it's not very purposeful. Dr. Ronald Laporte is one of the loudest critics of the fitness craze. He says the fitness message has not worked. Fitness is irrelevant for health in the United States. What we need to be able to do is to make people active and disregard the message of fitness. Activity is different than exercise. Activity can be incorporated into your daily lives. It's walking to the store. It's spending time gardening, doing purposeful activities. It's taking your car and parking it at a shopping mall further distant rather than waiting for a car to pull out. What I mean by activity is anything that will make people move more
And if you do, you're going to reap significant health benefits. Laporte's study of postal workers bore that out. We looked at postal carriers who were walking five to seven miles a day, that these individuals did in fact have increased levels of high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, which has been associated with reduced risk of coronary heart disease. You don't have to do aerobic exercise or very high-intensity exercise to get health benefits of increased activity. Some of us don't like to exercise alone, so walking with friends might be just a thing to do. The latest fad for seniors is mall walking. In Massachusetts, the Framingham Mall opens its doors for walkers before the stores open. It's a way to walk no matter what the weather, at a comfortable pace, and they're not trying to burn up all their fat at once. It's never too late, essentially, for people who are in their 50s and 60s who haven't been active, they still will derive important benefits by starting an exercise program. And the key issue there is to find something that they enjoy and that they're likely to stay with throughout the rest of their life. The good news is that people who walk at a moderate pace are two to three times more likely to keep at it. A walk helps lower cholesterol. It burns calories. As a matter of fact, a mile walk burns about the same number of calories as a mile run. Distance is more important than pace. The farther you go, the better. Ed Ryan says he feels better ever since he began to walk, just weeks after open heart surgery. You just can't help but enjoy coming in here and being able to feel good after working out. I, I can't tell you why people will do it, except I don't want to be back having another operation 10 years from now, so I want to be sure I, you know, I take care of myself. So, now if you're laying down, it's time to get up. And once you're up, let's go for a walk. You'll actually feel better. Dr. Rippey's data proved it. He studied mood changes of people who walk consistently for six months. And what we found was that when we asked people to walk indoors on the treadmill, there were immediate and significant reductions in anxiety and tensions and significant improvements in overall mood state. So we now have scientific uh, evidence that supports uh, the concept that's been around for a long time, which is if you're not feeling good from a mental standpoint, go out and take a walk. Now, for those of us who want to work out hard and fast but can't stick with it, remember that even the best of us have failed many times before succeeding. It took dance instructor Kathy Stein 13 years and 100 pounds to learn the value of exercise. First class I walked into, I left. <laughs> but I'm still here. Kathy was a slim teenager. But after marriage and four children, she weighed 226 pounds. After yo-yoing up and down the weight scale, she finally lost weight permanently through exercise. She credits her success to her attitude. I just played mind games with myself because I knew that I had to stay on top of it here. I knew when I had good days, it was because I had stayed on top of it because I was real positive. I would get up and Richard Simmons says, talk to yourself in the mirror. So I'd get up and I'd look at myself and I would say, good morning, Kathy. Today is going to be a great day for you. And it sounds so silly, but those were the best days for me. Experts still recommend a rigorous 20 minute workout three times a week. It's best to burn about 2,000 calories each week for maximum health benefits. But if you're not up to it, don't do it. But if you haven't gotten off your duff in years, the basic health message is simply that any increase in activity is a good deal. You're all the way, you're all the way. You know, it might surprise you, but the age group that exercises most consistently are those of us over 55. Now, it may be that we're not all jogging, we may be sailing or hiking or golfing or swimming. But you know, I think the real key to picking an exercise program that you can stick with is one that can be done in moderation and one that's fun. There's nothing I like better than climbing mountains. Now, our correspondent, Dr. Holly Atkinson, has looked into this question for us, and this is what she found. Red, there is no one exercise program that suits everybody. Some of us like to go it alone, others move best in a group. Some people make the mistake of thinking the only way to get exercise is to jog, when in fact there are countless ways for you to get the activity your body needs to stay healthy. Believe it or not, scientists have found that for some people, gardening is all it takes to get into reasonably good shape. The point is to find something that you like to do and stick with it. We do a 
Actually, please type in your ID code. Do you work out regularly? Yes. Which would you rather work on, Michel? Fit and trim or muscle size and strength? It was like, you know, going into a spaceship. And I sat in that machine and I just couldn't believe, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I pressed the buttons and this thing was talking to me in a voice. It sounded, you know, almost human. Go for it. The left, left, the Lord. It keeps your attention. It keeps your attention. And you really do feel like uh, that there is somebody, whether it's, it's a little guy inside you telling you, you know, what to do and how to do it. Science fiction has now become science fact, at least when it comes to motivating people to exercise. Power size machines couple computer technology and a weight training program to simulate the guidance of a human trainer. It does everything just as a personalized coach would. It motivates. It's with you each repetition. It tells you about breathing, range of motion. It measures your strength so you have the proper resistance. And it remembers from workout to workout. And after each workout, it gives you a score so you know how well you've done. As engaging as a talking weight training system is, it primarily helps with one major component of overall fitness, increasing muscle strength. To be totally physically fit, an exerciser needs to work on flexibility and aerobic fitness, as well as increasing strength. These components can actually be mutually exclusive, so that an individual can be extremely fit in an aerobic sense, but be notoriously inflexible and perhaps weak in certain mu muscle groups. Uh, we have other individuals who are extraordinarily flexible, uh, who may not be strong and may be in poor condition as far as aerobic fitness is concerned. It's important to realize that the three components of physical fitness are addressed by entirely different training modalities. And contrary to popular belief, there is no activity that will simultaneously improve all three. But if someone is trying to get the best possible results, the wisest thing to do is to use passive st uh, uh, stretching to improve flexibility to work with progressive resistance training on specific muscles to improve strength, and then take part in some continuous vigorous activity to improve cardiovascular um, uh, condition. There really is no single activity that will produce all of those. There may be activities that might enhance one or two of them. A, a good program really has to be balanced to address each of those issues. It is important to know your individual strengths and weaknesses before starting an exercise program. For example, people born with tight joints will only tighten further by lifting weights or jogging. They may develop arthritis later in life as a result. For them, developing flexibility through stretching would make sense. Loose jointed people may have no trouble doing ballet or gymnastics, but might be better off increasing their strength to avoid injuries like pulled ligaments. Here at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center Adult Fitness Program, a person's level of total fitness is tested before an exercise program is prescribed. The screening program um, will point out to people areas that they need to work on that maybe they didn't realize. We'll ask people before they even come in, what are their goals? And someone may use as a goal, they want to improve their strength or improve their endurance. And in fact, we find out from their evaluation that they have other areas they need to work on. Maybe their flexibility wasn't so good, or maybe their strength wasn't so good, um, or maybe their endurance was already pretty good. So the evaluation can tell us and tell the individual what specific areas they need to work on to at least come up to a minimum level so that they, their fitness can be an overall kind of fitness and not just concentrating in one area. To evaluate overall fitness, a series of tests are given. A treadmill test screens for the presence of heart disease and also determines the individual's level of aerobic and cardiovascular conditioning. Calipers help assess percentage of body fat. From these measurements, an estimate of ideal body weight is made more accurately than relying on height weight charts. And a stretching test is done to determine muscle flexibility. 
Today, Lori Gould Wong discovered what components of fitness she needed to improve on. You have some areas of decreased flexibility. Right. I'd like you to use these picture stretches and to work on your flexibility program. Okay. Your one area of decreased strength was your lower abdominal muscles. Right. All right. I'd like you to work on those. I'd like you to concentrate on doing the modified sit-ups. Lastly, your aerobic capacity. You were only in the average fitness range. I think if you start working out at the target heart rate that we've established for at least 20 to 30 minutes, three or four times a week, by the end of one year, you're going to find that your aerobic capacity has dramatically increased. Okay, that sounds good to me. I pretty much think I've identified the areas I need to work on and the things that I feel are my strengths, but I think it just helps by reinforcing it, by someone telling you, yes, you need to work on your flexibility or you need to work on this. And I think it helps motivate me by knowing that somebody else um, has discovered that and then we can set a goal to accomplish what I want to accomplish over the next year. The people who don't get a screening before they start exercising may do fine if they start off slowly and if they progress at a reasonable pace. The problem is people don't do that all the time. People do tend to have led a sedentary life and sign up for an exercise class and just jump right into it without giving any concern for um, their muscle tone or their flexibility or what underlying problems they may have. So it is important for people to know what areas they need to work on if they're healthy to begin with and what they can do to prevent injuries. Physical therapist and athletic trainer Alex Petruska couldn't agree more. Over the last eight years, he has equipped his home gym with machines designed to suit his needs and keep him fit. If I were to recommend one machine for fitness for someone to start with, I would recommend a rowing machine because the rowing machine does work the legs and the arms together as well as the trunk muscles or the back muscles uh, on a, in, a, in a good way. Uh, from there, they could, they could expand or, or build into other areas as they, as they needed to. A rowing machine like Alex's might cost between two and three hundred dollars. That's a big investment, but worth it for someone who uses it for a lifetime. Still, you don't need to spend big bucks to benefit from exercise. Probably still the best way to, to, to get an aerobic workout is to, is to be able to go out and go for a walk. We're, we're starting to see uh, evidence that, that people are able to get a good aerobic benefit from a, from a vigorous walk uh, on a regular basis. Uh, strength training is still possible using uh, pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups uh, and uh, different calisthenic type exercises. Uh, flexibility always is, is something that should be trained without, a, without equipment and can always be done anywhere uh, at no cost. The best overall program for most people to start an activity program undoubtedly is to improve flexibility. This has another advantage for the average person in terms of exercise adherence and that is that of all of the three types of training, the one that feels the best is stretching. If we watch cats waking from a nap, the first thing they do is stretch. They appear to enjoy stretching immensely. And people who stretch conscientiously get that same pleasure from it. That can act as a motivator to go to perhaps the next step. One thing about stretching is today they, they don't advocate that you do a bouncy stretch. Most stretches are, are or are or should be maintained for, for a long period of time without bouncing, and that also helps avoid stretch injuries. There are no shortcuts when it comes to achieving a good level of physical fitness. Slow and steady still wins this race. As we become fitter, we should progress gradually and cautiously. And as we gain experience in an exercise program, we develop that sixth sense. We begin to listen to our bodies. And people who are continually listening to their bodies will say, this is clearly hurting my knees. And pain is not gain. Pain is for idiots to suffer. If something hurts, your body is trying to tell you that something is wrong. So that's the time to talk to someone while it's just pain before it becomes an injury. One interesting facet about sticking to exercise programs has to do with family support. Rod Dishman at the University of Georgia found in his research that if a husband or wife seriously objected to the spouse working out, 
the chance of that individual sticking with that program was probably pretty poor. If a person in your family wants to be on an exercise program, then exercise becomes a family issue. Now let's turn to T. George Harris, our weekly commentator and editor-in-chief of American Health Magazine, and see what he's got to say. At my age, any hour of exercise probably adds two hours to my life. That's a good deal, but like most health benefits, the payoff seems too far down the road. Start jogging today and you sweat off a few pounds of water, but you have to keep it up three days a week for six weeks before you begin to get a real reduction in weight. It's nine weeks before your cholesterol starts down and 11 weeks before you feel a boost in your self-esteem. Small wonder so many people drop out of exercise before they begin to get the benefits that would keep them going. That's why Dr. James Rippey is hunting for quick payoffs. As director of the American Health Fitness Institute, he finds that some good things start the first day and they come from normal, gentle activities like walking. A 40-minute walk at your own speed brings a measurable reduction in tension, anxiety, and blood pressure. So next time you feel stressed, take a walk. Do it every day or so, and pretty soon you may feel like jogging or even dancing. Well, I hate to tell you folks, but we run out of time, and I want to have took it out of here. Next week on Body Watch, you're going to meet a top New York model and a rascally old Detroit jazz musician who are bound and determined to prove growing old isn't all that bad. We'll give you some research to back them up, evidence that good health, good mind, even Hi, sexual drive can stay strong I through the years, you. provided you're willing to work at it. Well, I sure want to thank you folks for watching Body Watch. We'll see you next week. I guarantee you that. Let's go, bud. Body Watch is made possible by the makers of NutraSweet brand sweeteners. Taking good care of ourselves makes life a little better. And NutraSweet makes it a little sweeter.